Hey everybody, welcome to Quest for Peace. I'm Aya Zaktar, and if you've never seen this show, uh, this show is all about trying to find some kind of inner peace. Uh, mostly it's about my story and how long I've been trying to find it. I'm not exactly there yet. I'm a lot less intense than I used to be. I started this this uh, this journey, this quest, that's what I call Quest for Peace, way back when I was 29. And that was about almost seven years ago. So I've been trying to figure out how to be a calmer human being, uh, not get as easily annoyed. And um, basically, I failed over and over and over again. And so I thought, hey, why don't I want to share this with some people? Because I have succeeded a little bit. And I know this would have been helpful when I was trying to figure this out a long time ago. And on this program, I sometimes am lucky enough to be joined by guests who will share their stories and how they have been calm. Because basically, if I know them and I'm interviewing them on this program, they're usually quite chill because they still know me after many, many years. <laughs> so today, we've got Mary Jo Foley on, <laughs> who I've known for several years now. But Mary Jo, if people don't know who you are, which is just impossible, how could you tell them who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm a tech podcaster. Um, that's one of my more recent gigs. I'm a co-host on Windows Weekly with Paul Therott. I also have been a tech reporter for more than 30 years now, and my gig currently is on allaboutmicrosoft.com, where I write about all things Microsoft, and that's on ZDNet. That's that. Yeah, we, we're sort of coworkers, not really, we are. because you are a freelancer still. And, I am. Uh, I've heard many, many stories, and I have no idea if we can say this stuff on air, so just let me know if you're like, no, we're not talking about this, <laughs> um, that you could be staff if you wanted to, but for some reason, you find it better to be a freelancer. Is, is that something you can discuss about why you find freelancing better than being a staff reporter? Yeah, sure. I, I have been a staff reporter before. I actually was on staff at CNET before and ZDNet before and a number of other places, but I really like working on my own and at home. And I like having a lot of leeway about what I cover and how I cover it and other things I do in addition to reporting on ZDNet. So I've decided for now, at least, I'm going to just stay as a freelancer. So I heard some, a crazy story before I started this program. I was talking to Andrew, and he said <laughs> that you at one point wanted to be a chef. <laughs> um, and you just mentioned that you've had many, many years in tech. So mm -hmm. one... Uh, why would you want to be a chef? And two, why didn't you become a chef? And how did this whole tech thing work out for you? <laughs> I actually started my career in tech. Um, I, I have my background as a journalist and not in anything to do with technology. I just uh, went to journalism school and I happened to get into technology as my beat area by accident. Uh, but I've always liked to cook. And when I was in one of my jobs as a tech reporter where I was feeling kind of dead-ended and frustrated, I decided to go to chef school. And so um, I went nights and weekends through a vegetarian chef training program here in New York City called The Natural Gourmet. And it took me a while. It took me over a year. But I ended up um, getting my chef degree and then I was thinking about, should I stay in tech at that point or not? And I started exploring some options I could have had if I had gone into cooking full time. And the money and the hours really discouraged me. So I ended up staying a tech reporter. So that's how that worked out. That, that, it is. So how were you already a tech reporter at the time? So you, were you uh, working at a, at a publication and then you had the time to take off to do uh, this course, these courses? Or did you do both at the same time? How did that work? Yeah, I did both at the same time. So I, it was right after I had moved to New York from Seattle. I had been living here about a year or so. And uh, I I wasn't that happy with the job I had at that time because it wasn't really a good match for my temperament and my skill set. So I thought, you know, what can I do that's going to make me happy um, while still being able to earn enough money to live in New York? So I looked into this program and I found out I could go nights and weekends so I was basically doing two jobs. I was going nights and weekends to chef school and cooking with a bunch of other people who wanted to train as chefs. And then day, daytime, I stayed in my path as a tech reporter. And so I was doing kind of two things at once. So what makes you happy nowadays? I mean, you, you, you're pretty <coughs> successful. You've, you seem to travel a lot. I mean, you know, you're mm -hmm. Microsoft, so they've got stuff all over the U.S. Yep. and uh, abroad. So what makes you happy? Um, well, I'd say... One thing that makes me really happy is living here in New York. And I, um, for a long time, even when I was a, a kid, I grew up in a really small town called Ashland, Massachusetts. 
um, you know, my whole high school class was like 90 people. And I just from, from way, way back, I remember thinking, I don't like living in the suburbs. I want to go to the city, even though I knew nothing about cities. My parents would not even take us into Boston very often. We only lived 30 miles west of Boston and we went like twice a whole year, maybe at most. <laughs> but I, I, for some reason had in my head, like, I like cities and I want to be in a city. And the first time I came to New York when I was, I think, like in the eighth grade, I said to the leader of our class trip, I'm going to live here someday. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's cute. Nice. And um, I, I, my whole life as I moved around the country um, for different jobs, I kept thinking, but I really want to live in New York. That's where I really want to live. So uh, when I was 39, I was asked by a friend of mine, what are you doing for your 40th birthday? What are you going to do? It's going to be really exciting or something. I'm like, no, nothing exciting. And the person said to me, well, why not? Like, why aren't you doing what you want to do? And I said, I want to live in New York. And then I was like, I do want to live in New York. Why am I not living in New York? So I found a way to move to New York. And I've been here for the past 15 years or so. And New York just makes me happy because I, I love that you can be anonymous here. I love that you can be yourself and people don't get weirded out if you're not the stereotypical person they're expecting. So I still love living here and I hope I can live here for a while longer. So that's one thing that makes me very happy. You know, that, that sounds like something I've done. I've, I've lived uh, mm -hmm. in different places. I grew up in Queens. This is the GFU mm -hmm. network. I, I grew up in Queens and I've always mm -hmm. wanted to live in Manhattan, but mm -hmm. I've, I've ended up in Boston where I went to school for, uh, I went to Boston university and then oh, no. I went to a school in Connecticut called Quinnipiac for law school. And then I went to Vermont law school which was really, really sleepy. It was a really sleepy town. <laughs> and, you know, it's, 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 it was like, okay, am I ever going to get back? Am I ever going to be able to go to Manhattan? Ended up at NYU for another year for a, um, a, another tax degree because why the hell not make the folks happy? <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I got to get back. I passed the bar in New, York, in New York State and I couldn't get a job. I just ended up in tech wow. because I was doing, I was a tech writer while I was in law school. And while I was studying for the bar exam, I was like, hey, you know, I'm hearing these, these things called podcasts. I used to watch these guys on TV. I, you know, if they can do it in like a little, little hovel, I could do this at home. So I started doing a podcast while I was studying for the bar exam, which... I never knew you went to law school. This is like a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. There's lots of things. Oh, I, for, I forgot to mention that between law school and college, um, I have a degree in biology. So my folks are like, be a lawyer, be a doctor. So this obviously didn't make me happy. That's one of the reasons why I'm a yeah. podcaster and, and writer <laughs> and uh, I make shows over at CNET. Um, the idea was, okay, make them happy, be a lawyer, doctor. So I got the, the bio degree. I didn't want to go to medical school. I wanted to do law instead. And in between those things, I did a job as a legal assistant. So I was doing this really kind of data entry level stuff. And I was a hothead back then and, and way, I mean, geez, immature, you know, 21 or 22. And just if, if something was wrong, it's like I took everything very personally and there's something wrong with what's going on. It's like, why are you, why is this so problematic? It was in foreclosure. So I just felt dirty after a while. So I left that and came back to Queens. And then I saw an ad for Apex Tech. Do you know Apex Tech, Mary Jo? I, I've seen ads for them, but I don't really know them. Okay, so Apex Tech is a automotive and HVAC school, and it's a technical wow. school. And so yeah. I saw an ad for it on television <coughs> while I was with my folks, and I'm like, I want to go to that. They're like, what? <laughs> they go, yeah, I want to do this. And they're like, why? I'm like, you know, I, I, I've never really been mechanically inclined. I can, you know, I can rig things, but I don't know anything about cars. Do you think that I can go there? And they're like, okay, are you still going to go to law school? I'm like, sure, I just need something to do between now and then. So I said, okay. So I went to automotive school for a whole year and I got a certificate in that. And the day I graduated was the day I got into law school. Which oh, was, gee. <laughs> and it was, this is all on my mom's birthday, April 14th. Wow. I remember this because it's on the paper. And then my brother called me up to tell me that I got into Quinnipiac. And I was like, good, because that's one school that took me because nobody else took me, which was, <laughs> which, you know, you got to say yes. So I went ahead. Great. So that was that was my crazy like way, wow. and I was like, "How am I going to get back to New York? Can't get back to New York." And I eventually ended up in Manhattan thanks to a nice transfer over at the San Francisco office. I used to work at CNET at San Francisco, and then I moved over. To, like, hey, can I go to the New York office? And they're like, "Yes." I said, I said "Great." Nice. And so mm -hmm. I live in a shoebox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, so so um, I just gave you a huge like. Oh, here's my my biography. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I, I don't I don't know that much about you, even though we've kind of 
worked so- alongside for mm-hmm. a long time. So I'm like, oh, I, I knew nothing about you, really. Yeah, I didn't know about your your cooking experience, and I didn't yeah. I didn't know you were from Massachusetts. So like, I am. It's yeah. weird because you don't do that with people normally. We're just chilling out with them. Like, so tell me who you are. What exactly. do you do? <laughs> and and so you really wanted to go to to live in Manhattan. Why mm-hmm. why Manhattan over like? Queens or Brooklyn or any other borough? Because, I mean, this is a really softball yeah. question, duh. It's, I think, it's super energetic. <laughs> but I'm just curious, what, what made you do that? And what, what about the city, other than an- anonymity and acceptance? Yeah. Is there anything else about the city that you enjoy? Um, you know what's funny? When I, when I moved here, I thought I was going to enjoy things that I ended up not enjoying. Um, like, everyone's like, oh, it's so awesome. You're moving to New York. You're going to be able to go to Broadway all the time. And I've been to a few Broadway shows, and I really don't like Broadway. And then they're like, oh, but you can go to the opera. I went to the opera. Nah, not, not my thing. I slept actually through most of it. And <laughs> <laughs> I, the thing I really like about New York is that you can just walk out your door and you're entertained immediately. Like you're just walking down the street. You might see a building you've never really paid attention to or some people who are walking by. Interesting, you know, or go into it. Like I, I take a lot of architectural tours here that is, uh, that are put on by, uh, the municipal art society where they walk you around a neighborhood and show you things that you've walked by a million times and you've just never noticed them. Um, so I, I like to do things like that. Um, I feel like New York, like it, it's weird how when you live in Manhattan, you kind of start feeling like the buildings that are here are yours. Like I feel like grand central station is mine kind of. It's like when I go in there, I'm like, oh, one of my favorite places. And I love going there and I just can't get enough of going there. Or I walk out my door and I turn and I'm like, there's the Empire State Building. How cool is that? It's like, this is my neighborhood. Instead of like getting into walking around and seeing grass and trees, I get into seeing buildings and um, people and, and new things and how much the city changes. I really love all that kind of stuff. So I guess that's why I like cities and especially this city. I, I don't I don't really know Queens and Brooklyn as well, although I've been going there more as I've lived here longer. And I really like the neighborhoodiness of those places, but I guess I always come back here because it feels like Manhattan is New York. Yeah, so my folks, they settled in Queens. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they were first-generation American. Uh, my grandfather had like a photo studio, a photo <laughs> shop, an actual shop where they did airbrushing and things in oh, well. Queens. <laughs> so that's why they settled in yeah. Queens. Yeah. Uh, and, and I always told them I want to do Manhattan. They, they would ask me why, why, why? And I would say the exact same thing you did, which is, this is yeah. just a very strange coincidence. I'd be like, <laughs> when you'd walk out the door, there's stuff, yeah. ma, there's stuff. You don't have to like walk, you know, six to seven blocks or get to a train to do anything. And it's just, yeah. I love the idea of being able to walk around and, mm-hmm. and that actually, I'm, I've, I've figured this out at some point, enough workplaces, this happens where I end up having a good friend at work and whether they want, to, whether I want to eat lunch or not, I will go with them for a walk because I'm like an animal. Like I need to walk. So <laughs> yeah, me too. I if, walk a lot. If yeah. you put me in a in a town that is not walkable, like uh, every time I hear anybody talk about Los Angeles, and I'm just like, I know, me can't, too. Can't walk, can't walk there. No. I mean, you got to have a car. And, and it's not <laughs> yeah. about the travel. Like, oh, there's nothing to see there. It's like yeah. I need to move. And yeah. Uh, yeah, everything you're saying is is very similar to why I wanted to be in a city uh, like Manhattan. And it's it's that is that's a really interesting thing that you. You thought that a location would bring you happiness, and you've obviously experienced that. Is there any other stuff other than a city? I mean, you've obviously followed your dream as a as a as a as a journalist. How did you even get into journalism, and why did you pick that? And how early were you? Like, you know, three not three five years old, and you're like, I'm going to be yep. a journalist, or you're like, I was. Can you believe that? Like, that it's one of those weird things because no one in my family was a journalist. Um, and then when, you know, when you're a little kid and people say to you, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, so many girls would answer like a nurse or a teacher. And I, I just suddenly was at five saying to people, a journalist. My mother was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, where is this even coming from? <laughs> and so when I was really young, maybe like eight, they bought me a toy plastic typewriter that actually could type. And so I, that was like the best present I got ever. And immediately I have, I have three siblings. I like said to them, look, we're making a newspaper and we're going to start making it now. And I'm the editor and I'm going to type it. And it, my mother was just like, where is this even coming from? It's so weird, you know? <laughs> And I, as I got older, I really loved English and writing and I just kind of always knew. It's like one of those weird things. You, uh, I was like, I know I want to be a writer. I don't know where or how or what kind of writing I'm going to do, but I really love it. And it, it's a little bit ironic because in my college tests before I went to college, I placed better in math than I did in English. And 
my math teacher is like, wow, you should really go into math or science. And I'm like, no, boring. I want to go into writing. And look what I ended up writing about technology. So <laughs> in the end, I guess I ended up in my happy, correct place. So do you know why exactly at five you said journalist? Or was that just like a fun word you just learned? Like, how did, how did that? I don't know. You don't and know. I, to this day, I mean, I always liked writing, even when I was, as soon as I started um, being able to write, I used to write stories and tell my mom stories, making up stories. And I love to read. I just couldn't get enough of books. And it just was one of those weird things. I'm like, hmm, what could I do? I could be a writer. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to say that. <laughs> yeah, that's so I don't know where it came from. I really do not. No that... one in my family was a writer or a journalist. Um, nobody was in that field. So I don't know where that came from. Yeah. That stuff never entered my mind. Like, oh yeah, you can do technology. <laughs> like, oh, you can, you can actually write yeah. stuff for a living. I'm like, that's a job. I didn't know it was a job. Yeah. Uh, there's, so, there's so many things that if, if I knew if, if there was a show like Mythbusters when I was a kid, yeah. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to do physics. That's going to be my degree because I totally love that. And I found that out yeah. in college, my third year. I'm, I'm, you know, wow. I'm getting my bio degree and <laughs> here we go. I take physics. And I'm like, this stuff's amazing. I love this. You can build stuff. You can engineer stuff. I should be in the engineering t uh, school. And I'm yeah. like, I, I'm not oh. going to stay here for another three years. That's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to graduate on time and get the heck out of here. Yeah. Um, class of 2001. So many yep. years ago, I went to college. Not that many years ago. <laughs> that was 14 years ago. I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about some low, like what I thought was recent news and then I looked it up and it was 15 years ago. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, it's, it's funny though, the part of, the part of journalism that I ended up liking the most wasn't writing. Um, as, as I've kind of gone through my career, I realized the part I love the most is the researching part actually. I love like finding little tidbits of information or people give you a tip and you turn it into a story. That's the part I like the most is the research part more than sitting there and, and kind of trying to figure out how to say it in words. So even now, I, I would say even after doing this for 30 years, my job still makes me really happy. But the part of my job that I love is the researching and turning um, tips and and putting connecting the dots, that kind of part of it. Not so much the sitting there and crafting the prose. That's not really the part I love. What do you do when you're stressed? I mean, when I'm stressed, uh, I've, I've taken to walking a lot more. I will try to yep. meditate if I can, although I should be meditating whether I'm not stressed or not, yeah. because that seems yeah. to be a big hook for me. And I actually was meditating this week. And I told people mm. in previous mm. episodes, I'd, I'd slacked. And I'm like, I'm trying to get back on the wagon on that. Because mm -hmm. it, for me, it's actually very beneficial to go, where am I? Because all the stuff that's already happened has happened. The stuff that's going to happen hasn't happened. Yep. So I need to stop exactly. worrying about it. So what do you yep. do when you're stressed? Well, you know, I also have, um, I would say studied is the word, studied meditation and meditated quite a bit, especially when I lived in Seattle. I joined um, a meditation group and I went on, I even went on a couple of silent retreats that lasted two weeks where you couldn't talk for two weeks. Um which was actually really beneficial. At first I was like, I can't do that. That's going to be impossible. Like you have to unplug and not talk to anybody and meditate, get up at 4 a.m., meditate all day. And I was like, I can't, I, I'm not going to be able to do that. But um, I think that taught me a lot about how when I'm stressed or frustrated or angry to just be able to stop and look at what was, what's actually happening and try to get out of a loop of, of negativity. So I think that is something that's been really helpful to me. Even though I haven't been meditating since I moved to New York, I feel like those kind of skills are something you, you don't really forget and you can call on them and bring them to the fore whenever you need them. So that's one thing I do. And I also kind of do something which is the antithesis of that. I, I um, use times when I'm frustrated and angry as a motivator too and I have to say, I'm not, I'm not a really huge believer in the Zodiac stuff, but I am a Scorpio and they say Scorpios are very vengeful and very, um, I wouldn't say angry, but they, they take, they, 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 they don't like to be wronged. So if I feel like I'm being wronged, I take that energy and instead of just lashing out at people, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get back at them. I'm going to use this as my motivation. And I use that in, in my job when people try to thwart me from doing things. I, I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, on the surface, I'll be very calm, happy, and I'll be like, "Yep, you're gonna, you're gonna pay, buddy," <laughs> 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 and you're gonna know when I make you pay. 
Yeah, um, so I, I, I turn that negative into a positive by using it as a motivator, I'd say. Yeah, that's that's actually been beneficial for me too my whole life. When people say, you can't do something, I'm like, well, I'll, sh- <laughs> I'll show you. I'll, yeah, I'll, just I'll, watch. <laughs> when, I went to, when I went to Vermont Law School yeah. and I wanted to go into tax law because that's what I actually enjoyed, shock and surprise, I liked tax. Mm-hmm. Uh, my advisor was like, where do you want to go? So I said, what's the top school? He goes, NYU. I go, that's where I want to go. So he goes, you know, like people don't go from Vermont Law School, it's a third tier law school, to New York University School of Law for taxation <laughs> because that's one very unusual because it's an environmental school. So environmental and taxation doesn't really go together, uh, at least in that jump. And also yeah. like, he goes, there's been like four people in the whole, in the history of the school that's ever done this. And he goes, well, I wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. I go, what's number two? He goes, Georgetown. I go, I'm not going to Georgetown. So <laughs> I worked my ass off for the rest yeah. of the year and was delighted to get into NYU and went to my professor, whose name, oddly enough, was Good Enough. So Oliver Good Enough, <laughs> who, uh, who I, he's, he's a lovely guy, he's a, he's a brilliant guy, a great professor. Uh, maybe he said it to motivate me. He knew that would work because it freaking worked. I got right in, and um, and that was really a huge jump for me because yep. it's just very wow. different, um, very different um, student body. Because I went to Vermont Law School. This is another thing where I found a tremendous amount of unhappiness because I go to Vermont Law School and this school is in South Royalton, Vermont. And it's such a small town, there are no stoplights. Yeah. I kid you not. There are, un- <laughs> there are these overpasses that are just, just wide enough for one car and the only way that you can get cars to go back and forth is by sheer courtesy. And there's a <laughs> lot of courtesy in Vermont so it wasn't like a big deal but I was like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> Why is this happening? Why are people waving to me randomly? Oh, it's like... <laughs> Oh, they're just I don't like this. <laughs> I, I'm like, why? Yeah, why are people? Why are they looking at the mountains? What does this mean? I don't understand. Um, yeah. But I finally got it. It took me eight months. I was staring out my window. I had like every every day. I'd stare out my window to go. Okay, there are mountains there. I don't get it. Why do people? <laughs> why do people like this? Like, why do they pick? They have paintings of this. They they travel to them. Why? Why do they do this? <laughs> eight months, day in day, I stared at this this window, and it finally hit me, and. I was like, oh, it's peaceful. Uh-huh. I get it. Nothing's <laughs> happening. It's like calm. And that, this sounds, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. I'm sure people have like looked at a mountain and was like, yeah, it's calming. It's like, duh. <laughs> Did not get it because I was so wound tight back then. Yeah. Um, yep. Would you want to, so you live in Seattle. So how, how different is that compared to New York or anywhere else you've been? Um, pretty different. I, I moved there from, for work. Um, I originally had moved from Massachusetts to Washington, D.C., from Washington, D.C. to um, San Francisco for a year. And then my boss at the time said, look, you're covering Microsoft. You should move to Seattle. I had never been to Seattle, but I'm like, OK, sure. Why not? And when I got there, I I was like, wow, it's not really it's a big city, but the city part of it is very small. And so most of it is kind of more of a sprawling um, kind of bedroom community, although that's changing right now a lot. Um, and the whole idea of having to go over the bridge from the Seattle side to the Microsoft side, because I was never going to live in Redmond. I'm like, nope, I'm not living in the suburbs. Um, but every, you know, a lot of people there, they like to do outdoor activities. They really love hiking and camping. And I, I hate camping. It's like one of those things I absolutely hate. And I, everybody's like, Oh, nature. I'm like, nature's nice. I like seeing trees and stuff, but I want the city. And <laughs> so I, I didn't really fit that well with with kind of like what everybody likes. Like, you know, people are into hiking and kayaking and there's so much great stuff to do there, skiing, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool, but I don't really like any of that. Not, not much. So I also wasn't a great fit out there because I don't know if you spent a lot of time in the Pacific Northwest, but it's kind of a laid back place all in all. And Everybody who met me within one minute of talking to me said, oh, wow, you're not from here, are you? And it wasn't because I talked fast. It was just they were like, you're very direct. We don't really like that here, you know. So it was it was tough. I had to go to a place where I didn't I kind of stuck out because of my upbringing and personality. I also was doing a job that people there hated because I mean, in effect, my job was to spy on Microsoft. That's why they put me there. And almost everybody up there has some connection with Microsoft. So when they found out what I did, it was like, oh, uh, we don't really want to be friends with you. You know, your, your job is you're here, like kind of looking for dirt and we don't want that. So I, after a while, I just was like, you know what? I, it's beautiful here and I'm sure it's a really great place to live, but I am an East Coaster and I need to go back, back somewhere on the East Coast. And that's when I moved 
to New York from Seattle. How did you handle that, handle that on the day-by-day basis, though? Because I, I would imagine you weren't thinking when you woke up, I'm moving tomorrow. I'm moving tomorrow. <laughs> so how did you handle that? Yeah. Well, it was funny. When I, uh, I was working at the time for, hmm, who was I working for? Maybe um, CRN, you know, which is a, a publication about the reseller industry. And I asked my boss at the time, I said, you know, I, um, I, I'm kind of unhappy out here and I'd like to move to New York. And he's like, hey, if you can swing moving to New York, we'll let you work out in New York. Um, so he's like, but we're not going to pay for you to move. And so I was starting to plan in my head, like, how can I move really cheaply to New York, um, and find an apartment and do all this from Seattle. So I ended up, the way I ended up moving was I just condensed my stuff down to 15 boxes and I took only 15 boxes of stuff. I took my clothes and books and I took a few pots and pans and I boxed them up and I shipped them UPS to the office where I was working. And then I found an apartment and (laughs) then I, every night after work would carry a few things from the boxes with me as I walked home. I'm not making this up. It's, I know it sounds really preposterous, but that's how I moved here. And so it wasn't like some big shocking move. It was kind of like, I'm just going to like do this and make it happen. And, you know, I I just kind of trusted I was going to be able to find something, which in hindsight, was really crazy when you know the vacancy rates here in Manhattan. But I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to make this work somehow. And I did. So and you, so I, I guess I just kind of gave in and said, let's make it work. So you came out here without an apartment? You had nothing lined up or you just? I, I um, right before I was set to move, I came out um, for a couple weeks and I saw a bunch of apartments and I couldn't find anything and I couldn't find anything. And then I, I was it was the last day I was here and I. Um, I was seeing apartments with somebody who was showing them to me, um, like a broker, you know? And so she said, I've got one more thing to show you. And I'm like, my plane's at three o'clock today. And she's like, okay. So she showed me an apartment down in the village and I said, I like it. I want it. And she's like, okay. And so they processed my paperwork. She gave me the key. I went to the airport and left. And then I went back to Seattle, got the rest of my stuff. I took a plane out a couple weeks later and that was my apartment. (laughs) Wow. That's, that's, that's gutsy. I know. It's slightly, it's slightly crazy. Uh, it was. But, you know, I, I felt like this is showing me that this is really a good move and it's meant to be because it's all working out. And I, my worst case was I was going to move here and like just say somewhere like, you know, um, like a I don't know what you would call it, like a monthly rental kind of place furnished and put my stuff in storage that I had the little stuff I had and hope it would all work out. But it all worked out. What about so, yeah. parting with your stuff? You said you were, you were sending only 15 mm-hmm. boxes over. I know a yeah. lot of people tie memories to things, and I, I've done a lot of work to try to avoid that at this point. I'll take pictures of items and go, okay, I don't need yeah. a graduation gown. I don't need this hat. I don't need, yeah. I don't need this, yeah. uh, whatever, a ticket. Um, mm-hmm. how, did you, how did you manage to separate yourself from your belongings that way? Because 15 boxes, especially if mm-hmm. you can ship them UPS, I'm assuming they're not gigantic either. They weren't. So no. how, did you, how did you handle like, losing most of your stuff, I guess? <laughs> Yeah. You know, I'm not, I, I'm not really a person who gets attached to stuff that much. Um, which is good because if I was, I couldn't have done that. I, the parts I'm like, what do I really want to take with me? And books, like I had a few boxes of books that I'm like, I can't part with these certain books and clothes just because I didn't want to have to buy everything again. Pots and pans, a few of my favorites that I had, you know, because I love to cook. I, I, I don't want to leave this one, but chairs, tables, couches, eh, who cares? Clothes I'm not wearing anymore. I don't care. I I just I'm not that attached to stuff, luckily. And so when I moved here, when I moved into my apartment in in the village, uh, all I had for a long time in that apartment was I bought a bed and I had one lamp and one chair and a table and that's all I had. And I I guess I just like being light and not having a lot of stuff because I feel like I'm more mobile and if I need to or want to. Just up and move someday, I can, because I won't have a lot of things to figure out what to do with them. That's, that's weird, because when I was a kid, I was thinking the same thing. I'm like, okay, I'm around 17 years old, I'm like, listen, I want to make sure I can fit everything <laughs> I own in the back yeah. of like a hatchback. That's, yeah. that's all I want, because that way, if I needed to go somewhere or wanted to move move uh, from place to place, I could do that, mm-hmm. which is weird, because I hate traveling. So I'm not really sure oh, why. Oh, do you really? Oh, wow. I, I don't like... Um, I barely like mm-hmm. leaving Manhattan, let alone, <laughs> let alone. <laughs> but then again, I used to live in all kinds of weird little places. So yeah, yeah. getting to the airport would be a little dip- difficult. I used to live in Petaluma, California. So getting to the airport right. was about, you know, it's, it's, it's a commitment. It's about yeah. an hour or something. It's a so, job. 
And yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like, geez, I'm not going to spend an hour in, in transit. That's insane. Right. Um, yeah. That was another thing. Like I prioritized for my happiness, what I needed for jobs and things. Like I pr- prioritized not having a commute or having the smallest yep. commute as possible. It's one of the reasons yep. why I live in a shoebox because I work mm-hmm. in Manhattan. So like instead of me yep. coming across, because okay, the 7 train is broken or the LIRR is broken, whatever's happening that day, there's a good chance I can get to work because I'm still yep. in the same area. And also I can work from home in some some respects. So you've minimized your commute to some degree because you, you work from yes, home. <laughs> so, so did you value your commute? Like how, how do you value your time? Because for me, I was like this yeah. commute, I'm spending you know two hours a day. I used to live in upstate New York. I'm like, mm-hmm. I could be learning something, doing something, sleeping, playing with my yep. kid. I could be doing so many other things. So I started yep. really pushing towards that kind of Manhattan dream. What, what do you think yep. about commutes? Yeah, same. I, I, I'm not a person who liked driving even when I used to have a car. And I just felt like it was such a waste of time. I'm like, oh, you can't really do much. You can listen to audiobook or whatever. But I'm like, hey, you know, I don't like driving. I feel like it's a waste of time. Even commuting on bus or subway, it's just it takes a lot out of you. So I'm like... You know, if I could live close enough to walk to work, that's my goal. And even when I first moved here, I could walk to work in 25 minutes. Now I can walk to work in like 20 seconds or less. So <laughs> it's like the ultimate short commute. Um, the, the challenge now, though, is like when you live and work in your same spot, how do you keep yourself from going nuts? And how do you how do you make it so you still have a life when when your desk where you work is right next to your kitchen table? You know, so. It's challenging, but but doable. And I think the trade off for the commute situation makes it worth worthwhile for me to to uh, have to figure out how to not go stir crazy. I, that's like such a smaller problem to me than commuting. So how how do you keep a divide between that? Because when I was looking for places and, and Liz yeah. was with me, I'm like, hey, I could live. Yeah. We could live right near work. And she's like, yeah. I don't want to live anywhere near where I work because she used to. Um, <coughs> work and live very well. She lived in Petaluma with me, so that's right. was something. She's like, yep. it's always the same people, and she basically yep. and for her her position, she, she used to work. Um, she used to work as in real estate, so she was yep. constantly running into residents who she'd put into apartments, and they're all yep. like, "Hi, Liz," and she's like, "I just don't <laughs> want to talk to you," but she'd be you know yeah. all happy because she's very good at that. Um, so like, how did you how do you balance that since you're right where you uh, right where you work and live is the same place. Yeah. Well, it helps in New York that it's such a big place that when I if I do when I do go out for lunch or to meet somebody, I don't usually even see the people who live in my building. Um, So it's not like I'm having that kind of an overlap. For me, it's more of a challenge of making sure I get out every day because some days I could literally just stay in here and not go outside at all. If I've like stockpiled some food or whatever, I'm like, okay, (laughs) I don't have to go out, you know. But I try to make it so I go out every day and try to just get out even even when I don't feel like it because the walking stuff really helps de-stress me. And it's also a reminder of why did you move here? You moved here because you love New York. You should get out and be in the city, not in your apartment looking out at the city. So I, I feel like um, I'm really good at when it's time to work, sit at my desk and work. I don't feel like I get up and water plants. Um, I do take breaks during the day if it's not too busy and I'll do something like make a really nice lunch for myself. Um, but I don't, I don't feel distracted that much. Like I feel like when it's time to work, I'm, I'm in work mode. And then when the day is over, I'm off work mode and I'm not thinking about signing on and doing a little extra work. I try to really compartmentalize my day that way. How are you capable of doing that? Because when I was, uh, when I was running a blog somewhere else, what would happen is I would be thinking about work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'd always be thinking about how to increase numbers. I'd be worried about, uh, what my writers were doing, I'd be thinking about how we should be doing things better, how to streamline and just doing that constantly. So I'd be you know, sitting at a dinner and then I'd be like, you know, whipping out my phone to write down an idea I had. How do you keep yeah. that stuff separate? Because that to me, I've never been able to really turn off. Yeah, I, I haven't been in the past. I haven't been as good at, as it, at it as I am now. I think um, having the opportunity in the past few years to do some international travel for fun. I went to Japan, then I went to Vietnam and Cambodia. And in those places I couldn't be on all the time because of my phone and because there wasn't internet in a lot of places. And so I, it really kind of gave me this perspective like, Oh, you know what? It doesn't really matter if you're on 24 seven, no one really even notices the difference if you're there thinking about stuff and writing stuff in the middle of the night so that you can post it at 6am. It doesn't really matter. 
It's not like what you want to be remembered for when you're old or dead. You don't want people to say, you know what? She wrote that one story that went up at 1 a.m. that was like really awesome. Instead, you just want to say what matters, what really matters in the big picture. Like what, what, are you want, what do you want people to remember you for? And what do you want to say when you look back at your life that, that actually mattered to you? And it isn't like, did I get one more story done? Or did I figure out one more way to get more clicks on my site? It, what matters more is what you end up doing in your life and how you feel about your life. And I feel like just being able to have that opportunity to truly disconnect and feel like what that is and make you, it, it kind of makes you go back and say, huh, being on all the time isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I, I feel like that really has lately made me a little more sane about you know, not taking work home with me, even when I am already home. Yeah, for me, way back when, when cell phones like first started really taking off, I was like, I'm not getting one of these things. I don't want to be bothered. Me too. I, I'm, yep, not, I'm, same. I'm like, there's no reason for this. And so yep. like at the time I owned, I had a, vi <laughs> a handspring visor. That was my, my little PDA. Yeah. Like, oh, cause yep. it can become a phone if I ever want one. So mm -hmm. I actually had a handspring visor. That was my phone. And everyone was confused with it. Like, what, what do you, what is that? I'm like, it's a phone. <laughs> They're like, it, it, no, that, what about the face grease when you put it on your face? I'm like, well, that, I guess that happens, but like, what are you going to do about that? <laughs> so fast forward to whatever years now, that it's everything's yeah. like that. But yeah, I, I liked disconnecting back then. And now I tr like, I try, and I, you and I have hung out where we've seen other yeah. friends who will go nameless, Alex Gumpel, who will never leave his <laughs> phone alone. Uh, and it's like, guys, sometimes you just want to be like, okay, put the phone in a pile. First one to grab the phone is paying for dinner because <laughs> yep. that disconnect where you have people who are in their phone instead of being where they are, yeah. that I have to be very careful because it does drive me a little batty. But then again, it's like if they're enjoying themselves and basically I get to like sit there for five minutes and wait, um, it's not so bad. I can like look around yeah. and go, oh, I didn't notice that they're, that that, yep. that table's wobbly. I didn't notice that that, that that's mm -hmm. ketchup over there. Look at that's lovely. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you something about uh, being a journalist and putting yourself out there because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they come to chasing dreams, if they want to be on camera, if they want to do audio, if they want to write, if they want to do anything uh, that's public facing, that there's this huge barrier because, at least mentally, that they're going to be criticized and they're going to be dealing with, there's going to be a hater. Somebody's going to hate their work. And especially yeah. now with, with internet, if anybody can publish and pretty yeah. much anybody can comment, how did you handle criticisms about your writing? I'm not talking about professional criticisms. I mean, just feedback. And then yeah. in the internet age being very different where it's like, you suck yeah. at MJ. It's like, oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. How, do you, yeah. how do you handle that kind of uh, reaction? Yeah. You know, I, it's funny because when I started as a journalist, well, this is, this is like, I was, I'm so old that I, I, I am so old that there, we didn't have the internet when I started as a tech journalist. So it, the, to say the field has changed a lot since I've started is an understatement. I, lo I got into journalism because I love the idea of being behind the scenes and not being visible. Like, so when, when stuff like podcasting started happening and, um, you know, comments on the internet and people commenting on your blogs, I was like, okay, I'm, I think I got to get out because this is what I don't want. But over time, I've just kind of thought to myself, you know what? Haters are going to hate. And um, I'm not going to let them get to me because I'm doing the best I can. And I feel like I'm doing a service for people and answering people's questions, helping them make decisions. And I know I'm not always right. So I try to acknowledge when I'm not. And I, I just feel like I'm doing the best I can. And when people criticize me, I mostly just let it roll. Um, if they continue and persist, I'll say, you know what, why don't you get your own blog if you, if you don't like what I'm doing? So I, I guess I'm really good at just kind of having a thick skin now and not caring. Um, you know, sometimes it gets to you. Sometimes you really get down about things or people send you a really nasty note. But for every nasty note I get now, I, I save a whole little folder on my desk of nice notes I get. And when I'm feeling down, I read through some of those and I'm like, okay, screw that guy. I Look at all the people who do like what I'm doing. And it, it's good. You just have to kind of balance that, I think. Yeah, I have, I have a, a little label in my Gmail that says good things. It's got yeah. like yeah. six things in it, but whatever. <laughs> and so I, I keep it and I'm like, oh yeah, because I, I only thought of it like fairly recently. So I'm like, oh yeah, these are good. Uh, yeah. fa fairly recently, I got some harsh criticism somewhere. I'm not going to mention where so they don't get any any jollies based on that. But I was just like, it was eating at me and I was just sitting there and I'm trying to yeah. figure out what if I suck at what I do? And I'm like, yeah. wait a minute. No, I don't. 
because exactly people well no no offense to the audience but people watch and they listen and they they yeah. actually do you, you're right there's a lot of compliments out there and it's yeah. i think it's very easy to ignore compliments and it is inflate uh these criticisms and i don't yeah. mean like a criticism that's constructive i mean if somebody says no. i as your audio sucks it's like oh okay yeah. uh, well, like, right. i can fix that uh, I, is, I is you're not British. This was another criticism I got years ago, and I was like, I, okay, like I, "You're right." I'm like, "You're right." I'm sorry. I I don't. I, that's not constructive. I don't. Do you want me to move? Do you want me to renounce citizenship? I don't know what they wanted me to do, but um, yeah. So like, that's the kind of thing where I think what what you just said there. If anybody's thinking about going into this kind of field and they're scared, don't be afraid to keep a log of the good things because I. I yeah. It's, I had logs of like when I was I was unemployed for eight months at one point and f I had a huge running list of places I'd applied to mostly because I didn't want to apply to a job more than once to make me look bad yeah. uh, but like it would be like okay and status rejected 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 I'm like <laughs> I'm changing the name of this to the rejection list because it was just yeah. depressing I mean eight months oh, going man. unemployed was pretty rough um, yeah. but yeah so definitely if you're going to go out there you're going to go out in this field or any field where you're public facing um you're gonna you gotta learn to build a thick skin. It's really yeah. the biggest thing I think for advice is don't necessarily say anything back. It's just like right. grade school, you know. I agree. Uh, yep. You basically, if somebody's bullying you, giving in to them, they know they're getting to you, and it's gonna bother. Oh, they can bother you again and again with the same kind of methodology. Yep. It's really, really odd. Let Let's talk about something much easier, real yep. quick before we go. Beer. Now, yes. I have <laughs> I have a quite an enjoy uh, I enjoy beer a lot, but it's and it, it's a it's a depressant, so it, is. it can be a madhouse if I drink too much, and I try to yeah. avoid that as much as possible at this age of mine now because I'm a little smarter than I used to be. Um, and so, so your enjoyment of beer, where did that come from? And do you any ever have any issues with the depressant effects of it? Because for me, sometimes I'm like, oh wait a minute, I've hit drink number four. The world sucks. Like oh. oh wow! Other times, like drink number four is like let's have drink number five, and I'm super happy. Yeah. So it's yeah. hit or miss. Yeah. Uh, so I when I moved to the apartment where I live now in Midtown, um, I was looking for a place that I could just like call my local, you know, somewhere you could go when you want to have an occasional drink. And I found Rattle and Hum, which I talk about a lot on my podcast in various places. And uh, I didn't know anything about craft beer, and so when I started going in there, I was totally clueless and the staff was really awesome and they were helping me learn and understand it. And the more I started understanding it, I was like, wow, this is a whole world I knew nothing about. And because I'm a foodie, it just kind of made sense to also become more savvy about craft beer and pairings of beer and food and all that. Um, so I, that's how I ended up getting really into craft beer. And then I started brewing beer myself. I, I do very small batches here in my really small apartment. And it, that's been really fun experimenting. It's like cooking pretty much. Um, on the depressant side, no, I don't feel depressed usually after drinking a number of beers, but it does sometimes make me sleepy, <laughs> um, which is a problem. So I have to watch it for that reason more than being depressed. It just, if I, if I am trying to do anything after going out and having like a beer tasting or something, it's kind of pointless. Um, so I don't, I don't have the depression part of that so much. I don't think I, the part I really love about the craft beer community and the craft beer phenomena is the community part of it. So got, because people who are into beer, they kind of take it lightly. They, they, I feel like they're not maybe as over serious as some people who are into wine can be. And they name beers really interesting and funny things. And people tend to like to share beers and so things like bottle shares and beer tastings, all those kind of things where you come together with people and just actually talk. You know, we do stuff like check beers in on Untapped, so we are using our phone. But mostly, you go to a bar when you want to just sit and talk to somebody who's ever sitting on the bar stool next to you or the the people who are serving you. And, and I like that community aspect of it. I think that's what makes me kind of come back to it is the community. Hmm. That's an interesting way to put it. When it comes to that, I mean, you're, you're lucky you don't have to deal with the depressant effects. That, yes, that, that, I am. <laughs> that just might be me, me, an excess at times, or my therapy yeah. sessions failing at times. I don't blame my therapist; oh. I blame myself there. Uh, but yeah, you know, the, just just a word of advice to folks. By the way, this is really simple. If you didn't know this, beer is really good. But <laughs> if you're down and you're out, don't bother with it unless you want to feel like crap the next day. Uh, I don't recommend that idea. You know, occasionally have whatever yeah. you want, but. Don't you know if you're in a bad mindset, it doesn't usually make things better. 
And no. um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, there, that could be a whole That's other true. discussion. Um, yeah, true. <laughs> Mary Jo, before we leave, is there any parting words you want to give to the audience before I ask them, uh, before I ask you where they can find you online? Any parting words? No, you know, um, I think the only thing that I've come to realize that I don't know if this would help other people too is there's something really positive and um, peaceful for me in routine. I have a job where I don't have much of a routine because every day you start, for me, I start my day. I don't know what's going to happen news wise. I don't know what I'm going to end up doing. Like, am I going to have to run out and cover something or, um, you know, sometimes you have a little heads up on that, but not always. So for me, I, I can't say enough how much the little routines of life kind of stabilize me. Like every morning I get up, I make a pot of tea. Like no matter what else is going on, how crazy the world is, I sit there and I drink some tea to start my day. And I, I feel like people don't have enough routines like that in their life or they don't appreciate the routines. So that's something I have felt over time that if you can, even in the craziest days you have, just have something that you know you're going to do every day or every other day it, and really enjoy it for what it is. It really goes a long way. It sounds simple, but it's, it's like one of those grounding things for me. I mean, that sounds simple, but yeah, routines, I think when, when stuff gets crazy, once you can get yeah. back to that little routine, however yep. small it is, it does <laughs> yep. definitely help you come back to go, oh, yes, I, you know, I can, I can actually keep, I can keep it together to do the next thing. Yep. So now we'll do the promo part, which is okay. still weird. So Mary Jo Foley, if people want to find you online, how could they possibly do that? Uh, they can find me by going to my blog, allaboutmicrosoft.com. Or they can find me on Twitter at Mary Jo Foley, where I am tweeting day and night, not except I do take some breaks to unplug. Um, and then every Wednesday, I do Windows Weekly with Paul, and we tape from 11 a.m. Pacific to 2 p.m. Is that right now? 11 to 1. <laughs> <laughs> 11 to 1. I'm like, oh, I still can't do the, the math on the time change. Um, so uh, we have a live chat going on at the same time. So you can come and talk to us there and during the show on Twitter as well. So that I think that uh, felt really familiar. I don't know why that felt familiar. Yeah, but you may you weird, may have heard of that show. It's Windows weird, Week. weird deja vu right there. Anyway, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap up. And folks, if you have any questions in general, you have no idea. You're like, OK, I want to I, I want to ask you some questions about, you know, screwing up or I want to ask you questions about doing well, whatever the heck it might be. There's an email address for this show, quest at gfqnetwork.com. If you got questions, you got comments, if you got ideas, whatever you want, just you, know, you can shoot me an email. I will get back to you when it comes to that. Uh, we have a Twitter account finally. It's at Quest for Peace TV. That's fine if you want to put public stuff up. That's why we have the email in case you're like, I don't want to tweet this out loud and everyone will see it and make me feel weird. But yeah, you can go there. It doesn't have a ton of followers. I'm not terribly worried about that. More like, hey, if you want to use it, go ahead. It's, it's out there for you. And if you want to just tweet at me, because I will constantly, I'm always on Twitter, at IYAZ, at IYAZ. You can see it somewhere. I'm sure it's somewhere in my lower third. That's me somewhere if I do this button. Look at that. <laughs> There's a bird there. Anyway, Mary Jo Foley, thank you so much for being on. And uh, I think I think I learned a lot about you today. We're very similar. Who knew? That's pro Well, that's probably why we don't get along at all. Exactly. Why we're always fighting. Ex that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it for this episode of Quest for Peace. And remember, you can watch and get old episodes at gfqnetwork.com. We've got over 20 episodes now, lots of interviews with lots of folks. So if you want to learn more about people, go check it out, gfqnetwork.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>